Okay, in this video lecture, we're going to be talking about the muscular system. And there's really three parts to this video lecture. The first one, it's how skeletal muscles produce movement. Then we're gonna look at how skeletal muscles are named, and then we're gonna finish off by reviewing all of those principal superficial skeletal muscles of the anterior and posterior skeleton. But let's start with that first section, how skeletal muscles produce movement. In this section, we're gonna cover muscle attachment sites, the origin and the insertion. Then we're gonna talk about levers and leverage. We're gonna move on to cover the effects of fascicle arrangement. And we're gonna finish off this section by talking about coordination. First off, just so we're on the same page, when we're talking about the muscular system, we're talking about skeletal muscles and all the associated connective tissue that make up individual muscle organs. Now, importantly, skeletal muscles produce movement by exerting force on tendons, which in turn pull on bones or other structures even like the skin. Most muscles cross at least one joint and they're attached to the articulating bones that form that joint. So when such a muscle contracts, it draws one articulating bone toward another. Now, importantly, the attachment to the stationary bone, it's referred to as the origin, and the attachment to the movable bone then, it's called the insertion. So what we're looking at here, it's primarily the humerus, and then we see two muscles on either side of the humerus. We see the biceps uh, brachii, and we also see the triceps brachii. So in this example, if we talk about the belly of the biceps brachii, uh, you can see it originates on the scapula, which you can see up top, and it moves down the humerus and it ultimately inserts on the radius. So similarly, if we look at the posterior muscle, the triceps brachii, we can see that it originates on the scapula and the humerus, and it moves all the way down and it inserts on the ulna. So this is just an example, um, just so we're all on the same page of, of, of what muscle attachment sites are all about, origin and, origins and insertions, that is. Let's turn our attention now to lever systems and leverage. Now, importantly, bones serve as levers and joints serve as ful fulcrums. The lever, if you follow along in the top right-hand image here, it's acted on by two different forces. You have a resistance or a load. So in this example, you're looking at a load placed in the hand. Maybe it could be a dumbbell, for example, if you're doing bicep curls in this top right hand uh, image here. And you also have an effort, or you also could call the effort the muscle force. So it's important to understand that there's really three things you need to know. You need to know where the fulcrum is, which is otherwise known as the axis of rotation. You have a muscle force or an effort, and you have a load or a, a resistive force. So levers are categorized into three different types, and it ultimately uh, determines, it, it's determined by the position of the fulcrum, the position of the effort or the muscle force, and the position of the load or the resistive force. So there's three different types that we wanna talk about. The first one, it's a first class lever, and you can see this on the left hand side of this slide. So in a first class lever, the fulcrum or the axis of rotation, it's located between the effort, which is also called the muscle force, whatever works for you, and the load. So an example here, uh, you see the pair of scissors where you have the axis of rotation in the center of the scissors, and then E, uh, the handle of the scissors where you're exerting the force or you're exerting the effort, and then the load, it's on the other end, that's the blade of the scissors. The other example of a lever, it's a second class lever. Now, in this case, the load is between the fulcrum and the effort. So you can see here, the example is a wheelbarrow where you're exerting effort on the handles to lift the wheelbarrow. The load, it's in the wheelbarrow and the axis of rotation or the fulcrum, it's the wheel uh, of the wheelbarrow. In the example above, uh, in the middle top example, you can see the axis of rotation, it's gonna be the ball of your foot, and the load is gonna be all of your body weight transferred through your, through ultimately your ankle, 
and you have the muscle force exerting effort on the back side that's your calf and your soleus muscle which you'll learn about later on uh, and they're pulling your body up the last example it's a third class lever and in this case the effort is between the fulcrum and the load and the example it, it's kind of what we we showed you first it's the um, the, the bicep example and you can also look at the example of a pair of forceps. But if we look at the example top right, you see the fulcrum or the axis of rotation, it's your elbow joint. And you see the, the effort or muscle force, it's exerted through a tendon, uh, through the bicep brachii and the radius, and then the load is farther out. Now, the last thing I wanted to mention, it's this definition of leverage. So leverage, it's the mechanical advantage or mechanical advantage gained by a lever. It's largely responsible for a muscle's strength and range of motion. Now, the range of motion, just so we're clear, it's the maximum, maximum ability to move the bones of a joint through an arc. So you can change the mechanical advantage um, through certain um, situations, through certain pieces of equipment that you could wear when you're lifting weights, for example. But let's give you a, a, a real fundamental example here. If we wanted to improve the mechanical advantage of, let's say, the top right image where we're looking at the bicep brachii, then one thing we could do is we can cut that tendon of that bicep off and we could place it farther away from the axis of rotation or farther away from the fulcrum and that would give us a mechanical advantage. Now we're not going to go into a lot of detail about moment arm lengths here. Uh, maybe we'll save that for another time. But this is an example of increasing the mechanical advantage of this joint. Now, just so you know, certain humans actually have tendon insertions that are farther away from the axis of rotation than other humans. And they would be said to have a mechanical advantage in, in certain types of sports. And further to that, uh, just as an example to really try to drive this message home, chimpanzees, they have uh, a, a tendon insertion uh, of their bicep muscle a lot farther away from the axis of rotation of the fulcrum here and that allows them to to hang and climb trees and it gives them tremendous mechanical advantage tremendous strength and power development compared to compared to humans skeletal muscle fibers or muscle cells are arranged within the muscle in bundles called fasciculi. Now the muscle fibers are arranged in parallel fashion within each bundle, but the arrangement of the fasciculi with respect to the tendons may take one of five characteristic patterns. You can have parallel, you can have fusiform, triangular, circular, and pennate. And um, ultimately the fascicular arrangement, it can influence flexibility or it can influence the amount of power that a particular joint can generate. So if we just kind of go through these and review them a little bit, uh, we can start from the top left of this figure. We can have parallel arrangements of fascicles, and this is when the, the fascicles are parallel to the longitudinal axis of the muscle. So they're gonna terminate at either end in a flat tendon. Um, you're gonna have a lot of flexibility with these arrangements. You can have fusiform arrangements, and this is when fascicles are nearly parallel to the longitudinal axis, but they terminate, well again, they terminate in flat tendons, but you can see there's more of a taper toward the end of the tendon. And these muscles are also quite flexible. You can have circular um, arrangements, and this is when fascicles are formed in concentric circular arrangements. And oftentimes they, they form sphincter muscles that enclose various orifices. And you can also have triangular patterns. So this is when the fascicles are spread over a broad area and they converge at a smaller point. And it really gives them the appearance of this triangle. And you can also have what are called pennate arrangements. And there's actually a couple different types of pennate arrangement. So you can have fascicles arranged only on one side of a tendon. This is referred to as unipennate. You can have bipennate arrangements. That's when you have the tendon down the center and fascicles arranged on both sides of the tendon. And then you can have multipennate. And so just as you can see here, this is when fascicles arrange kind of obliquely from many different directions. So the amount of force that uh, a particular joint or muscle can generate, it's really based upon the cross-sectional area of that muscle. So if you're to cut 
and 90 degree angle to the arrangements, then you're gonna get, start to get the cross-sectional area. And you're gonna have the largest cross-sectional area in the multi-pennate formation. So those are gonna be able to produce the most amount of power, so multi-pennate fibers, fiber arrangements. But they're also gonna be the least flexible. The fibers arrangements that are gonna be the most flexible, uh, as you probably can guess, are gonna be the, the parallel fibers. Let's talk about coordination with the muscle groups. Now, most bodily movements are actually coordinated by several skeletal muscles acting in groups rather than individually. And most skeletal muscles are actually arranged in opposing pairs at joints. So this is referred to as antagonistic, when muscles oppose each other. Now, importantly, a muscle that causes a desired action, it's referred to as the prime mover or agonist. And the antagonistic muscle produces the exact opposite movement. So if we're doing a bicep curl, then your bicep brachii, that's gonna be your prime mover or your agonist, and then your triceps brachii, that's gonna be your antagonistic muscle. Now, most movements actually also involve other muscles called synergists. Now these synergists, they serve to steady the movement, thus preventing unwanted movements and helping the prime movers function more efficiently. Now, importantly, some synergist muscles in a particular group, they also act as what are called fixators. Now fixators ultimately stabilize the origin of the prime mover so that it can move a little bit more efficiently. Now it's important to understand that under different conditions and depending upon the movement at which point is fixed and however many muscles are involved and various times of the movement, any particular muscle can act as a prime mover, an antagonist, a synergist, or even a fixator. Let's move on to talk about how skeletal muscles are named. So in this section, we're just gonna talk about seven features that are used to name skeletal muscles. And if you understand or if you recall or, or remember the name of a particular muscle, I think you can understand a lot more about what it does from its name. In some cases, based upon its name, which is normally uh, a root word and a couple other combinations of words, you might be able to determine things like its origin or insertion or it's even, even its movement. So let's go ahead and talk about some of, these, some of these features. So the first one, it's direction. And when we talk about direction, we're talking about the orientation of muscle fascicles relative to the body's midline. So certain terms you'll see uh, maybe in front or, or at the end of a, of a muscle, terms like rectus or transverse or oblique. And they all relate to where the muscle is in relation to the midline. So for example, rectus, it's parallel to the midline. So for example, your rectus abdominis, your abs, center of your body. Transverse, perpendicular to the midline, something like your transverse abdominis. Your obliques, which means it's uh, diagonal to the midline. So this is a pretty good hint at identifying what that muscle does and where it, uh, where it might be located. Another aspect is size, and we're talking about the relative size of the muscle. So if we, if we know there's one muscle called maximus, then another muscle is called minimus, then you could probably guess which one is bigger. For example, the gluteus maximus is gonna be bigger than the gluteus minimus. But other terms could also fall in this category. Longus means long. Brevis means short. Latissimus means wide, like your latissimus dorsi or your Latin muscles. Um, longissimus, the longest. Magnus, the large. Or major, larger. Minor is small, and vastus is huge. Other common features, the shape, and we're talking about the relative shape of the muscle. So for example, you may have heard of your shoulders being referred to as deltoids because they're kind of triangular. Trapezius, kind of look like trapezoids. Or serratus, it's like sawtooth. Um, you also have other terms like your rhomboid, which is diamond-shaped. Orbicularis, circular. Pectinate or comb-like, piriformis, pear-shaped, platus, flat, quadratus, square, or it has four sides, and gracilis, which would indicate that it is slender. You can also um, come up with names for muscles based upon the action or the principal action of that muscle, what it does. So a flexor is gonna decrease joint angle, an extensor is gonna do the opposite, it's gonna increase joint angle. Abductor or abductor moves away from the midline, uh, whereas adductor moves bones closer to the midline. 
Levator, it means it raises. Depressor means it lowers. Supinator, turns palms anteriorly. Or pronator, the palms turn posteriorly. Sphincter, decreases in size of an opening. Tensor, makes a body part rigid. Or rotator, the bone rotates. You can also uh, name a muscle based upon its origin. So the number of tendons of origin, for example. So biceps, plural, there's two origins. Triceps, there's actually, actually three origins. And quadriceps, there's four origins. Finally, uh, location, the structure near which a muscle is actually found. So for example, um, the temporalis is gonna be found near the temporal bone. And finally, origin insertion. That's the site where the muscle starts or ends. An example would be the sternocleidomastoid. It starts in the sternum and ends towards the mastoid. Now I know there's a lot of muscles covered in this chapter and I want to cover the, the most important ones. I want to identify the superficial muscles uh, anteriorly and posteriorly. And specifically, we're gonna focus on a few in the head and neck, a few in the back, a few in the chest and arms, a few in the legs, and a few in the thorax and abdominal wall. So let's start with the head and neck and let's identify some of those muscles that you're gonna need to know. First, we have the occipital frontalis. Now, the occipital frontalis it draws the scalp anteriorly, it helps raise the eyebrows, and it actually wrinkles the skin on the forehead uh, when you get that sort of surprised look. Another muscle, the orbicularis oris. Now, this muscle fiber, you can see it, it surrounds the opening of the mouth, but it does a couple other things. It closes and protrudes the lips, so for example, for kissing, um, it compresses the lips also against the teeth, and it actually also helps shape the lips during speech. Another muscle, the orbicularis oculi. You can see it here, it's quite distinct. It follows a circular path around the orbit and it's responsible for closing the eye. The next muscle, um, the masseter or uh, the chewer, which you may also know uh, as mastication. Now, this muscle is responsible for elevating the mandible. So it is responsible for closing the mouth. The last muscle that I want to mention here in the head and neck area, it's the sternocleidomastoid. Now this does a lot of things. It allows flexion of the cervical spine, it extends the head, it also allows the head and neck to laterally flex to the same side and rotate the head to the side opposite to the contracting muscle. And it also helps elevate the sternum during forced inhalation. With regards to the back, I want to mention the trapezius, the deltoids, the infraspinatus, the teres major, the teres minor, and the latissimus dorsi. So let's just mention a couple things about those, particularly the movements. So the trapezius, it's very distinct. It has this sort of uh, triangle appearance. Superior fibers in the trapezius allow upward rotation of the scapula, but the middle fibers, they allow adduction. So you're adding to the body adduction of the scapula and the inferior fibers here you can see they depress and upward rotate the scapula also superior and inferior fibers together rotate the scapula upward and they also help to stabilize the whole scapula the deltoid it's another prominent muscle with a couple different branches of fibers the lateral fibers abduct the arm so move it away from the body anterior fibers they help to flex and medially rotate the arm and posterior fibers here, they extend and laterally rotate the arm, um, all at the shoulder joint. The next muscle I want to mention, these are a couple of smaller muscles. It, next one is the infraspinatus. The infraspinatus, it laterally rotates the arm. The teres major does a couple things. It extends the arm at the shoulder joint and it assists in adduction or adding to the center of the body. Uh, uh, and medial rotation of the arm, so a rotation inward. The next one I want to mention is the teres minor. The teres minor, it's really responsible for laterally rotating and extending the arm. And the last one I wanted to mention with regards to muscles of the back, it's the latissimus dorsi. Quite prominent here. Um, ultimately, it's responsible for extending 
adducting as in adding to the body and medial rotating or medially rotating the arm at the shoulder joint. It also draws the arm inferiorly and posterior. Let's now turn our attention to the chest and arms. So I want to review very briefly the pectoralis major, the serratus anterior, the triceps brachii, the biceps brachii, the brachialis, and the brachioradialis. So just a couple words on each of those. So the pectoralis major, it adducts and medially rotates the arms and the shoulder joint. It also allows flexion from the clavicular head and allows extension of flexed arm to the side trunk from the sternocostal head. The pectoralis minor actually is under that, so you really can't see it here. The next muscle that you can see, however, it's the serratus anterior. So the serratus anterior, it abducts the scapula and rotates it upwards. It's actually also known as the boxer's muscle because it helps to move the arm in a horizontal line like punching. The next group of muscles is the triceps brachii. Now, of course, tri means three, so there's actually three heads of the triceps that extend the, the forearm at the elbow joint and they also extend the arm at the shoulder joint. The medial head, it originates from the entire posterior surface of the humerus inferior to a little groove that's built for the radial nerve. The lateral head originates from the lateral and posterior surface of the humerus. And finally, the long head originates from the infraglenoid tubercle. So let's turn our attention to the anterior part of the arm, the biceps. So the biceps brachii, uh, it has two different heads and ultimately they're both responsible for flexing the forearm at the elbow joint. It also supinates the forearm at the radial ulnar joint and it flexes the arm at the shoulder joint. Now those two heads, you have the long head and you have the short head. The long head originates from the tubercle above the glenoid cavity of the scapula and the short head originates from the corcoid process of the scapula. The next muscle, the brachialis, this simply flexes the forearm at the elbow joint. And then the last one I wanted to mention, the brachioradialis. And I think you probably have an idea of where this goes, what it does. It flexes the forearm at the elbow joint. It supinates and pronates the forearm at the radial ulnar joint to a more neutral position. Let's now have a look at the lower body. And I want to review a couple muscles here, including the gluteus maximus, the TFL or the tensor fascia latte, the iliotibial band, which isn't really a muscle, the gracilis, the adductor longus, the sartorius, the group of hamstring muscles, the group of quadricep muscles, the gastrocnemius, the soleus, and the tibialis anterior. So let's just mention a couple things about each of these muscles, and let's start right back at the, up at the top. So the gluteus maximus. The gluteus maximus is primarily responsible for extending the thigh at the hip joint, and it also laterally rotates the thigh. It also helps lock the knee in extension. The next muscle, the TFL, or the tensor fascia latte, that's responsible for flexing and abducting the thigh at the hip joint. And it actually attaches to this other structure that I mentioned called the iliotibial band or the iliotibial tract, and that's really all connective tissue. The next muscle that I wanted to mention is the gracilis. The gracilis adducts the thigh at the hip joint. It also helps medially rotate the thigh, but it also can help flex the leg at the hip joint. The adductor longus adducts the thigh. The sartorius muscle, it really is not a strong mover. It weakly flexes the leg at the knee joint and weakly flexes, abducts, and laterally rotates the thigh also at the hip joint. And then we have the hamstring group of muscles. So the hamstring, it's really ultimately a group of muscles that are responsible for flexing the leg at the knee joint. And it includes three different muscles that you need to know. It includes the bicep femoris, the semimembranosus, and the semitendinosus. On the front or the anterior side, we have the quadricep uh, muscle group or the quadricep femoris. And that group of muscles is really responsible for extending the leg at the knee joint. And it includes the whole uh, rectus and vastus group. So you have the rectus femoris, and then you have the vastus muscles. You have the vastus lateralis, you have the vastus medialis, and you also have another muscle, which you actually can't see here, 
It's called the vastus intermedius. It sits below the rectus femoris, but it's not shown here. The next muscle that I want to talk about is the gastrocnemius, and that's your calf. It's responsible for plantar flexing the foot at the ankle joint, and it also actually helps to flex the, the leg at the knee joint. And almost there, just two more muscles to mention, we have the soleus now. The soleus, it plantar flexes the foot at the, at the ankle joint, and then finally on the anterior aspect of the, of the lower leg, we have the tibialis anterior. The tibialis anterior, it's responsible for dorsiflexing the foot. Now let's talk about the thorax and the abdominal wall and some key muscles. I want to mention the external intercostals, the internal intercostals, the diaphragm, the external obliques, and finally the rectus abdominis. So starting from the top, a couple words about each of these. The external intercostals, they're responsible for elevating the ribs and increasing the dimensions of the whole thoracic cavity. And what this does, it allows inhalation. And the opposite happens when you relax them. Relaxation actually depresses the ribs and it decreases the volume of the thoracic cavity and that causes you to exhale. The internal intercostals, when they contract, they draw adjacent ribs close together to further decrease the dimensions of the thoracic cavity during forced exhalation. So they're really involved during exercise, for example, but maybe not so much during normal quiet breathing. The diaphragm, that's another uh, important muscle, and it really drives most of our breathing uh, all the time, especially during normal quiet breathing. So in this case, contraction of the diaphragm, it really causes it to kind of flatten out and ultimately that has the effect of increasing the dimensions of the thoracic cavity and that is going to result in air being taken into the lungs or inhalation so the exact opposite when when they relax that will cause a reduction in the size of the thoracic cavity and that will force you to breathe air out or exhale the next group of muscles it's the external obliques so the external obliques they're responsible for helping to compress the abdomen but they also can flex the vertebral column and they can aid rotation. The last group of muscles that I wanted to mention, it's the rectus abdominis. The rectus abdominis, they're responsible for flexing the vertebral column, especially at the lumbar portion, and they can compress the abdomen to aid in various bodily functions, including forced exhalation, so during exercise when you have to get air out of your lungs, but they can also help during other things like childbirth as well. Okay, that's it for this video lecture. Uh, next time we're going to be coming back and looking at nerves and aspects of the nervous system. We'll see you then.